the, the breathing, the meditation, the cold therapy has really changed my life. Um, and in, in very measurable ways, you know. Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Benjamin Chan. A quick reminder for those that enjoy this podcast, please take 30 seconds to leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and subscribe to the YouTube channel. This helps the show get discovered organically and helps me continue to bring on amazing guests. Also, there are now timestamps in the show notes, so please feel free to jump around to the part that interests you most, although I always recommend listening to the episode in its entirety. Benjamin Chen is a leader in business and technology management, having raised over $500 million in investment capital and led due diligence on over 30 acquisitions. Mr. Chen launched the LAMPS business unit of RAB, delivering the largest single electronics product launch in U.S. history, and spent time as an entrepreneur in residence for both JP, Morgan, and Mission Ventures. Mr. Chen graduated from the University of Southern California and holds black belts in three disciplines, Taekwondo, Hapkido, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. These conversations always surprise me as they enter territory that I never planned on covering. I appreciate Mr. Chen's transparency on business insight, philosophical notes on life, loss, and of course, martial arts. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Without further ado, Benjamin Chen. I was very excited to do this, Ben, beforehand, as I told you at training, but after you sent me your bio, I was even more excited because you're kind of the perfect guest for the show in the direction that I want to take it because you have this very impressive blend of business acumen that I actually didn't even, I had no idea, which is often the case with people at, at the academies. You don't really know anyone beyond the fact that you get to train <laughs> with them. Um, so seeing that whole side of your life and then on top of that, to have three different black belts across three different disciplines, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Well, look, it's, it's my pleasure to, you know, and I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm honored, you know, and, and flattered that you asked me. So, you know, I'm excited to do it. Yeah. So I, I thought a lot about where to start. And I think the reason that I chose to start here is because, like I said, you have a very unique view here in that you have begun again at so many different points in martial arts and then also in business. And I'll, maybe I'll touch specifically on the martial arts side of it because you have three different black belts across three different disciplines. And that's not something, you're not given one because you're proficient in the other. So why, why this desire to be a beginner hmm. again and again in your life? You know, I, it's interesting that you use the word beginner, right? I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't think of it as, as that as much as it's just my path. It's a journey that I'm on. Yeah. Right. And, and so, you know, I've been lucky to have the opportunity to meet a lot of wonderful people, you know, mm -hmm. and in, in the first discipline, you know, that I got a black belt in it, which is in Taekwondo, you know, I was in Los Angeles um, and I started late, you could argue, you know, as, a, as someone that was in college and, you know, I, you know, had a friend, a roommate that was, was starting to train. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm training with Jun Chong at the studio in Los Angeles. And, you know, it's, you should come, you can, you should come. Right. So I, I get over there and it's, and it's very traditional, you know, right. old Korean guys that have a real background. And so this guy, Jun Chong, that I initially learned with, you know, he had this, there was like a lot of speculation. He had bought Chuck Norris's studio in Los Angeles. Yep. And he was kind of known as a super badass. Like, like there was this undertone of like, maybe he was an enforcer for certain collections before when he was really young. And, you know, right. he, he was well known as this, you know, just no bullshit guy. And, and when I started training with him, I got that feeling that kind of really authentic, 
like here is somebody that really knows something that I want to learn from. Mm -hmm. And he had the greatest, you know, he still has this greatest smile on his face all the time when he's working out. He wasn't a big guy, you know, and there were some other bigger dudes there. And, you know, very, very traditional, you know, kicking, punching. Uh, you know, you could say Taekwondo is mostly kicking, right? It's like walking along with a loaded shotgun with your legs. Um, <laughs> but he added this kind of, you know, um, American style boxing, you know, to it. And, you know, the, the irony of that is that it just really enthralled me. It, like I really got glommed onto it where I just loved the whole process of, you know, learning something and then at that time we were actually really doing you know some sparring you know which right. was interesting at that time and and so we would spar and so you would learn techniques and spar just like we do in jujitsu and you could get hurt like you wore gloves and you could get hurt um and i remember that or you can get knocked out and it knocking out didn't happen very often but you know and very senior guys you know, you would, of course, not get as hurt as much. It's, of course, the right. white belts that you're getting hurt, uh, as usual. And it was just the whole process, learning, you know, and being in shape. The, the high that you get from at the end of the workout is just incredible. It's just like, oh, you're sweating and you're just, you know, and you're just going through this process. And, and so... I just, I really fell in love with what martial arts, you know, and especially at that time, Taekwondo was giving me. Right. It is interesting. The, the, the sensation of, of completing a workout is one thing, but the sensation that you get following combat sports activity, whether it's sparring, live sparring or training, when there's that element of not that it's not, you're not in a real life altercation, right? Like you, you and I train together, we trust each other. That's an important part. I want to know that Ben's not going to try to rip my knee in half and vice versa while we're training because in that environment, we can both get better. But there's something special about it. And, and it is very addictive. I, you know, I've been in, in fitness and athletics my entire life. And unfortunately, didn't have the opportunity to train martial arts when I was younger. But nothing gave me that that sensation. When you get done with rounds of sparring, even if you're a novice like me and, you know, let's say like Muay Thai and you get done with those rounds. It's just, it's like a different adrenaline that you get that you just don't get any. It could be the hardest workout in the world, the toughest CrossFit session you've ever been through. And it just doesn't even hold a candle to that feeling that you get when you're done. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it was interesting. There was a conversation that I briefly had with a, a new student that came into the gym this morning wow. and you know, it was his first time. And, you know, I was kind of, you know, kind of, he was asking a, a lot of other questions at the end of the class. And he was saying, you know, well, you know, how does jujitsu work and what should I be focused on? And, you know, it was kind of like very super open-ended. And I told him, I said, look, you know, this is a place that you can safely, you know, interact with other human beings and practice something that is so kind of enthralling um, and learn and grow at the same time, right? It, it's, that's what martial arts, I think, can bring you, especially Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu today, right, is a great, you know, uh, place for that. And I, I think that there is this common, I think, oneness of you know, all martial arts in one sense, you know, and I don't want to say they're all the same, but I think for me in my journey, it is, it has been really about this process of learning, of growing, of, you know, having an allegiance, of having a, mm -hmm. a fraternity, you know, and I recognize there's sororities there too, but, you know, just that feeling is, um, I can't describe, you know, what it means. It, it's just like, I feel like I'm really a part of something. So if, if we can go back for a second to this, uh, 
we'll say like the genesis of you kind of getting involved in Taekwondo, your roommate got you interested in it. Were these feelings of a, a kind of longing for this camaraderie, this brotherhood, this community, were they present in your life at that time? Or, or were these things that were missing and, and maybe you were looking for them and it just so happened that you stumbled upon them within within Taekwondo? Like how is how is your relationship to that in the years that preceded discovering martial arts? I, I think clearly, you know, um, they were things that I needed. You know, and, and I think... You know, when I was younger than that, right, I, I was, I think I was always feeling like I never had that, you know, that kind of, um, as much of the, of that kinship that kind of happens when you're with, you know, a tribe, right? And so I think that's something that I needed, that I was searching for and wanting in addition to everything else. And we're... Where were you in, like in your career on a professional level at, at this point? So I'm, you know, I'm a year away from graduating college. You know, I went to, I went to USC and, um, and, you know, I think the world was still very much kind of, you know, an oyster, you know, like maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that, you know, kind of thing. Right. So it, it was a really kind of a, a time when, you know, I was really on a path searching for myself mm -hmm. you know and I, I think that there's i i resonate with this concept of of an ultimate truth you know i think that finding truth is really difficult to do because mm -hmm. i think that the answers are always with you you could look to an oracle, but at the end of the day, right. the answers are there with you, within me. But to actually have the courage and to go through that process to find myself, mm -hmm. that's really difficult. Are you, a, are you a religious person? I would say I'm a spiritual person. I mean, at, at one point, it, you know, I was, you know, uh, a born again Christian, let's say. At another point, I was mm -hmm. more, you know, maybe super Buddhist, you know, I mean, but, you know, over time, you know, I have come to believe that there is something greater than myself, that there is a, something uniquely special. And I would say that every human being has a special energy that exists within them. I've always found it fascinating. So, so I am not, uh, not by like <laughs> a rejection. I'm just not a religious person. Um, maybe I would fall in the bucket of spiritual more than anything just by practice, right? By meditation and, and con conceptually just how I think about existence. Um, and again, not, not because I, have uh, qualms with religions, but nothing has struck the chord for me ever. And I laugh so often at how religious I am about martial <laughs> arts and how much it fills this, like, I guess what, what I come back to is maybe there's something in most of us that you are just kind of searching for something like that, right? And maybe you find it in... Uh, in your community, maybe you find it in religion, in, in church, in synagogue, in temple, whatever, uh, or perhaps you end up stumbling across something as meaningful in, in something like jujitsu. But I always find myself just chuckling at how I treat jujitsu. I mean, I, I'm so in over, head over heels for it, right? Like, I, it is such a part of my week. It, I, I love what it teaches me. I love the philosophy behind it. I just obsess about the, the martial aspect of it, this code and uh, kind of the unwritten understanding of what you're participating in and the levels of respect and all these kind of things. And so I always find it interesting when there's other people involved that are uh, that also don't really identify with a religion, but speak about it as if it has represented that for them in some way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say that... You know, I, 
over the, the, the years, I have come to really appreciate this notion uh, of knowing myself in the journey. And I think it's hard, you know, um, not to think about this question, you know, as you're doing this soul searching, right? You know, because I, I kind of liken it to, you know, I, I have to, well, this gets into a longer kind of conversation, but I, I, I look at it as all as one plane. Like, mm -hmm. and... So, it, uh, existence? Yeah, and, and, and more importantly, just the notion of the engagement. Like, I'll, like, so I'll, I'll start at a high level, right? So there's this guy... So, we got time. Yeah. Go for it. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's this, this warrior, Sun Tzu, right? This famous general, right? Yep. And, you know in his pre prerequisite for understanding warfare, he basically, if you really drill down the tenets of the book, you know, the art of war, there's only three things you need to know to win. One is, you know, information about the opponent that you're sparring with or the enemy. Two, it's about the environment. Where are we fighting? Right. And three, it's about yourself. Now, I thought through this a lot, and it seems like to me that number one and number two, knowing about the, the opponent, knowing about the terrain, those are probably easier to get information about than really understanding yes. yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you come to understanding yourself, well, then you're like, okay, well, one part of that is what is my spiritual or what is my belief system? You know, you kind of have these three places of yourself. You've got your, you know, physical aspect of it. You've got right. uh, an intellectual aspect and you've got an emotional aspect. And I think a true warrior someone that is going through life in a leadership way has to have pretty good clarity on those three areas in their life. And so I have this belief that if, if that is all in tune, mm -hmm. if I have that clarity, then I can get to a point of what I call stillness. In an engagement, I liken it to, you know, you have a pair of binoculars. You're looking through the binoculars. You'll notice it's pretty hard to see the image at, you know, in the view if your binoculars are shaking all the time. Right. Well, if you think of, you know, your engagement that way, if my vibration is singular, in that moment, I can see. I can hear, I can feel, and I can see everything that's in front of me. In jujitsu, for instance, I could feel my partner's weight distribution. I can see their movements. I can, you know, and if you think about it in this context, the more clarity you have as a singular focus within yourself, the easier it will be for you to see what is truly being given to you, as we like to say in jujitsu, that what's really right in front of me. But it's easy to be confused. It's easy to not have that singular vibration. Things come into your head, you get confused. Oh, I gotta, you know, change the baby's diapers or, you know, you're, you're you know, <laughs> things are happening. But in that true yeah. kind of oneness, you have that ability. And so I often feel like this question about spirituality is, you know, or, you know, where, you know, what you believe in is a core function of that. If there's confusion about that, I think, then it also leads to, I think, the, the binoculars are in a funny way and you never know exactly what you're really seeing. It, it almost reminds me a little bit of, of just the idea. And, and, and this is a, you know, practice pulled from Buddhism, but to be present like that, it, that seems to be the end goal of a lot of 
the meditation practices is to have momentarily gained clarity in what you're doing. So whether it's the binoculars stop moving for a second or time slows down so that you can make a decision, whatever that is, by becoming more aware of your conscience and how you perceive the world around you, you can begin to put the brakes on it a little bit and have time to to think or to execute as one unit. And that's actually, it's interesting you bring that up because I felt like jujitsu specifically, and I don't have a, a experience with other martial arts as you do, but outside of Muay Thai, it's one of the few opportunities where I'm, I'm pushed into a present state by purely by environmental factors. Like because, because jujitsu is happening, I, I'm forced to be present with it. I'm not thinking about the baby diaper. I'm not thinking about the car insurance, where are my car keys, what's my wallet, my, like whatever those things are, they're not happening because a momentary lapse in clarity, now the position's changed. Now they've got your collar, now they've got your sleeve, now they've swept you, whatever that is. And it's the, because the stakes are so high, it forces me into this spot. And it's, I try constantly to replicate this. Very few times in the day, I'll find myself actually clearly present the way that I am when I'm on the mats. And it, again, it almost goes back to that, why it's so, it's so addicting for me. It's, it's this teacher. It's, it, it is in reality, a teacher of all of these lessons that I've been trying to glean from other areas of my life and finding speed bumps along the way. <laughs> Yet here's this activity that kind of forces it upon you to be there and to do the thing. Is that Was that feeling something that you developed over, or, or maybe not even feeling, but just like conceptually to think about it the way that you just explained it? Is that something that came to you right away with Taekwondo? Or did you start to develop and learn this journey and this patience and presentness as you went from one to the next and now just having received your black belt in jujitsu? I definitely didn't start with that, you know, and it's still something that I work on, you know, when I'm on the mat, you know, on a day, on a daily basis. Um, you know, I would liken it to the, to this notion of, I really love the term uh, we have in jujitsu, which is, you know, take, what is given to us. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a simple phrase, but I kind of look at it as something that is really about the whole function of, of my life. You know, what is given to me is really what's in front of me. If I'm present, I would see it, whether it's on the mat, mm. right? Or I'm in a, a situation with my daughter or I'm in a business situation, it's all the same. There's something there that is actually what is really being presented. Now, I could try to, right. irrespective of what's on the mat, decide that I'm going to be bigger and stronger than the 220 pound guy that I'm rolling with, and I'm going to you know, bench right. press him and basically do this one move in my head that I want to do, right? Right which we both know won't work. It oftentimes <laughs> does not work, right? And if it does work, right. you've expended so much energy and wa- essentially yeah. wasted so much of your energy being inefficient. The efficiency of jujitsu, the, the notion of, of taking or seeing what's in front of you, engaging with that as it is, is it's a very profound, understanding. I mean, it is something that has taken me many years to get comfortable with just that concept. It's almost like there is this other side part, which is, you know, the concept of control. Right. Right. In my view of the world, right, control is really an illusion. It's an illusion that I like to think I'm in control. I like to think I've made lists. I like to think I've done all these things to predict my day, my week, my month, my years. But that's really not true. As much as, and I'm not saying not to try, but I think 
life can change in a, in a nanosecond. And I think, you know, jujitsu in, in some ways is like that. It reminds myself when I'm on the mat and I'm trying to do this move. Okay, but that's been shut down now. Right? <laughs> so I could cry about it. I could keep pulling at the arm and hoping that it slips into, you know, my triangle. But the reality is it's gone. Yeah. So I have to learn to accept what is in front of me. The concept of acceptance, a very difficult thing to do, because in the beginning, you don't want to just accept. You want to control. Yeah, and fight. And fight and change. Because that's and you, what you can you rely have on. You lots of energy. You might, you, know, you might flail around. But as I've gotten older, I've gotten very deliberate in really trying to understand what is in front of me. And it, whether it's a patience to do that, or rather it's just an acknowledgement that that's really the truth of the situation that's in front of me, that will then dictate really the set of actions that are required for that engagement. Were you always seeking this? I mean, I mean, this seems like a, a pretty stark realization. It, it, like, and I say that um, the irony is the simplicity of what you're saying, right? That after you know a lifetime of success in business, three black belts across three different disciplines, the, the thing that you're arriving at is to accept what's in front of you, which is. It's almost funny because it's such a clear and concise concept. It's so simple. It's so simple. And yet, if you told that to someone just starting out in anything, in life, in relationships, in love, in business, that's not the answer that they want because it seems so stupid. But in reality, it, re it really truly is an X factor if you, can, if you can go beyond just hearing that mm -hmm. and actually think about what it really means and then apply it to anywhere. Apply it to anywhere where you have resistance, right, in life, which is usually the genesis for our suffering, is that we're trying to force a square peg into a round hole. It's we're, we're not seeing the adjustment that can be made, right? You're going for the arm bar when the triangle is staring you in the face. You're trying to get a Kimura when you have an Omoplata. Like what, and those are just examples, but this could be in in anywhere, right? And I, I can speak to this directly from multiple points in my life, even within the last, you know, five years of really trying to force things that weren't there. And, and it's just being infuriating. So when you look back to, again, this journey through these martial arts, like when did you start to feel yourself really pulling at the strings of the philosophy behind all of that? So I will, I, I will, you know, I'll share something with you that you, you, you may not know, is, you know, um, 19 years ago, uh, I had my, my first daughter passed away from a tragic accident after her first birthday. I didn't know that. And I'm sorry. at that time, you know, I, I had already achieved a lot, of, I thought, in my life, right? And... Um, and so here I'm now faced with, you know, I would, you know, characterize it as it's like a neutron bomb has exploded in the house. Mm -hmm. And basically I, I would have traded anything right to gain back, you know, that situation. Um, but that was not to be. And the reality is, is that at that, at that point in my life, all the things that I thought that I was controlling or leveraging, or I realized that that was really all kind of, you know, a mirage. That life truly can really change instantaneously. So, you know, what do you do when that happens, right? You know, and I faced a number of issues, you know, like I, I did a lot of searching because I was not in a good place. Right. And right. and 
it was it was an irony. Like I I remember having you know this conversation with this you know Jewish rabbi that had recently well not recently but had become a Buddhist um, you know priest essentially, and I'm on the phone with him. And I'm just searching for anything. I'm reading books. I'm going to therapy. I'm just trying to crawl out of this hole that I'm in, this really dark place. And I remember him saying to me, and he said, Ben, you know, he, he related his own circumstances. He told me, he said, look, he had lost... in two separate incidences, his children and his wife in two tragic accidents. Jeez. And he, he, he said to me, he said, Ben, you may not be able to accept this at this time, but you need to realize that you have been given a gift And, and over time, you will understand that. And I was just like, you know, I, I don't know what to say about that part, but, you know, there's no way I think that that's ever the case. And I still would trade everything. But the For advice sure. that he, For you sure. know, the other part of the advice he gave me, he said, look, Ben, whatever you feel, you feel it. If you're in a business meeting and you have to exit the room and you have to walk around the building and cry and do whatever you need to do, you do that. You have the freedom to do that. And it was really interesting, his thought process on this, because it basically really focused my entire life, this event. Like all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. all of the, the noise like the knocking at the door, hey, do you, do you want to buy another newspaper subscription? Or do you want, all of that just went away. It's yeah. just like, what is important in my life? What do I care about? All the noise just evaporates. It's like you have a superpower. Like you can literally turn yeah. on a dime and basically say, okay, I'm in this now. I'm focused. And and so when you ask me about, you know, how did I come to this place of, of, of my journey? For sure, this was a major catalytic event in my life. Right. Where I really view things in a very... I don't think of it as I... There's the concept of work that I don't love to do. And then there's the concept of play or there's this concept of, I look at it all as one whole, Mm -hmm. right? Time is precious. Yeah. And so, you know, having, having something like that, but the irony of that is, is that it's actually like, if you, you know, look at old people in, in, in hospice, right? The things that they tell you, it's all the same. Live your life. Right. Yeah. It's man. It's so. It's one. I'm. I. You know. There's no words that I can say. I'm extremely sorry for the loss, and I th- thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, I, I. I. I grapple with this sort of thing all the time. Um, of like material and career pursuits, and then just. <laughs> you know, taking what's in front of you, your loved ones, your family, your immediate, the life that you're actually participating in all the time, whether you're there or not. And it's twisted. It, it's hard. It, it's hard to care about the things that you know for a fact are the most important things. It really is. It, it's a weird, it's a, just a weird part of existence. Like I can, I can sit here and get so been out of shape and worried and fed up and and motivated and excited and depressed and whatever about career things and financial things and and burdens that truly just aren't even present but we think about them we we make them present in our lives when i 
I love my fiance to death and I'm so grateful to have her in my life and happy about the life that we live and th that I can call both my parents. Like there's, there's just so many things that I can look them straight in the face and be so grateful. And yet even that isn't enough to really pull me into a point of, of acceptance that like things are good. You know, it, it's, I think it's very challenging. Um, with the expectations that I think, you know, it's easy to, that you have in life um, to kind of filter away, you know, to the state of calmness or the state of peace that you, that, I mean, I look at it like in my life, you know, I, it, you know, as you, as you know, I, I have a daughter now that's, you know, uh, 17. And I can tell you that my approach, my thought process had, has evolved, has changed. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. If she has a question, you know, when she was really little at five, I would kneel down to her height level and I would pay attention. And now that she's 17 and she has a need, I will, of course, also pay attention. But, you know, if you think about it, that life is actually pretty simple. It's actually very, very simple. And the things that are actually really important, that hasn't changed. It's all the other right. stuff that you might kind of try to fill yourself with. And, you know... But at the end of the day, you know, what's the argument about? Is it is it right. really <laughs> that horrible? Yeah. You know, is it life or death? Is it the kind of thing where it's really, truly that situation? I would argue that the majority of things that are out here are not. Yeah. So I think the old you know, adages are the, are the, are the ones that are really filled with the most wisdom, which is be present, live your yeah. life, be happy with the things you're doing, you know, be, you know, have a truth about yourself. You know, I, I think all of those things as simple as they are, and they don't cost any money. You know, it's not <laughs> <laughs> people to tell you, you know, to, to, you know, None of that it happens. It's free. Yeah. You know, it's funny when you, uh, when you're rolling, this, this is a really good example of this in practice is you get to where, wherever you are in your journey of martial arts. And I, I would imagine this is probably true for Aikido, for Hapkido, for Taekwondo, for whatever martial art you're practicing. If you engage in sparring, you get to the mat and you see who's there. And after you've been training for a while and you kind of know people at your academy, you know the pace of certain roles. You know which ones are going to be really intense, which ones are going to have a, a, a lower pace, which people kind of have your number. Like there's just general cataloging that your brain does. And when I, I'll get there, your, your brain just starts doing that. It starts going, who's here? What's today going to be like? What intensities am I going to be at? Do I, am I going to need to tell people that I'm nursing an injury like are they people i trust where i i can kind of accept that they're going to keep me safe and i don't have to communicate that whatever the things are that are going on you can build up other people in your head much bigger than they are you can imagine that people are going to be stronger that mm. they're going to be quicker that they've been getting more technical because they've been going and you haven't or you took a week off and they didn't whatever stupid math you want to do in your head and then when you slap hands it's all gone none of it matters and all you're faced with is the person in front of you in this real time, extremely present thing. And if you're sidetracked by any of that, then you're going to be out of your element and you're not going to learn and, or, or you're going to get advanced on or you're going to end up in uh, suboptimal positions that you typically wouldn't because you're thinking about something else. And it's life can be very much like that. You build up all these, you know, you build up your job and you build up this deal that you got to close because if you don't close it, then that's, you're not going to hit your quarter earnings. You're not going to get a promotion. Well, all this stuff, but you're not even in the meeting yet. 
you're not even there. You're not even face to face. You're not even in that spot. And I think that's one of the parallels from, from martial arts that I see come up constantly is just how ready to run my brain is all the time about things that have nothing to do with what's actually in front of me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see this problem a lot, you know, with, you know, um, early, early level sales, salespeople, you know, mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they have a script and then they basically look to execute the script and that's all they know. So they're focused okay. on, I want you to buy this magazine subscription, you know, right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, um, and when I was young, I used to do door-to-door do -door sales for all sorts of weird things, candy bars, magazine subscriptions, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, jujitsu is like that. And a martial art is like that. Right. You kind of learn a set of things and you start your engagement. And it's like, right. oh, I'm going <laughs> to get that triangle on this. Yeah. You know, and you focus 100 percent. I'm just going to. But really, in in the rush to do that. You don't see the other things that are in front of you. Yeah. And I just liken that life is like that. Like if, if you just stopped for a moment or had this stillness, okay, what is in front of me right now? You know, it's like the music plays, but music is defined by the fact that there's, you know, gaps in between the notes. Right. And I liken, you know, martial arts and rolling like that. You know, if I can get myself to a place where I can be just empty. Yeah. Now I'm ready to feel, see, you know, intellectualize what is in front of me. Totally. And that's what I With strive for is in those, in those engagements is trying to get better at that. So if, if we zoom out for a second and look at, um, if we just assess like business career and maybe you can speak a little bit on the parallel tracks of like where your business career was at various points within your martial arts career, because I'm very curious to see if there was any crossover in how you operated at, at the C level or when you're, you know, out trying to get investment funding, you're at a startup, like all these, your, your careers had very different, types of, of opportunity that you've been inside of, it seems, from the outsider looking in, of different levels of experience that you've had or, or very unique roles, even like uh, being an entrepreneur in residence at a very corporate company like JP Morgan, yeah. but being brought in as a outside mind to do creative free things within the structure of a corporation, it's very unique. I mean, I don't, I've met a lot of people um, from my years training at the C level and never anyone who embody that entrepreneurial role there and so i'm curious maybe you could just elaborate on, on on all of that as a whole but then talk about what aspects of martial arts you actually did find valuable because i have seen frequently crossover in these two areas of highly functioning business people on an intelligence level but also just a tenure level and this draw towards martial arts and i can only imagine that there's crossover there Sure. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I've been lucky to um, kind of be in this entrepreneurial technology space for some time. And, um, you know, it, it happened a while ago, you know, like this was in in 1994. You know, that's there was a company called Netscape that basically built web browsers and they went public and the days were early like this concept of broadband wi-fi kind of thing that's just like a whole you know iphone's not around i mean it's 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 a brave new world you're using like an old clunky right. <laughs> computer with black and white screens maybe with some color occasionally but you know it it was a different time and at that time, I was working at, at CBS, the broadcaster on the West Coast, and I was managing most of their technology um, at this production facility. Um, 
in Studio City, CBS mm-hmm. Studio Center. And, and I was lucky enough to see the internet come and to participate as it came. So we were the first customer for Pac Bell to bring internet wow. to a business facility. That's just so like, not not to stop you here for a second, but it's crazy to that there are people listening to this that don't have any semblance of understanding of what it, that there it was even time before the internet existed. I, I I'm old enough to remember very beginning stages of it that the computer that we had, the noise it would make when you're dialing up and then the limited things that you could do as you were operating on it. But to imagine even now having lived in that time, a, a moment in time that pre, predated broadband internet, it's, it's just kind of trips me up a little bit. <laughs> it was a funny time, you know, and yeah. and I was always, you know, very kind of entrepreneurial, you know, even before I got there, I had like a small computer store, you know, before that, that when I came out of college, I was selling computers to a number of folks. And, and I was kind of like this geek nerd that when you came to my dorm room, you would get your term papers printed out and stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> but pre Bitcoin. So you're, you're doing it all. Exactly. In the... <laughs> yeah. Pre Bitcoin. Um, you know, so it was during that time that I, I was lucky enough to kind of think about the concept of a startup, right? So I had, I had put together a partnership of different companies together to basically try to produce internet content for primetime television shows. Like streaming, but like early, early, early like, stages. Like a streaming. website that even yeah. had a, an image, a photograph from a primetime television show. Wow. <laughs> the rights for a single had to be discussed in you know, infinitum with all different legal teams. Because there was no concept wow. of displaying content that was either on a long form movie or in television and taking any of that content, a song, you know, a picture, right. a drawing, anything. And I saw the internet coming and I was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. We should, you know, put some stuff online. And and through that process, I you know, found, you know, I, I was part of three other guys and we basically, you know, did a startup in San Francisco to fundamentally create internet content for, you know, wow. we were probably one of only like maybe less than 10 key firms in the country doing that. And I, and we, we would go and we would, you know, we had to go through the process of raising money and going through that whole kind of startup process. And and so I just remember some really interesting moments, you know, like we're we're meeting with one of the four guys. His his father was super wealthy. And so we went to go raise money from him initially. So I'm in there with, you know, the name of his father is Stanley. And so I'm in there and we're at this beautiful, you know, Washington, D.C. high rise building that he owns a whole building kind of thing. Right. And we're sitting in this yeah. huge, massive seating area with these giant chairs like on a big circle (laughs) and i'm listening to the son talk to his dad and i'm just kind of i'm just listening to the banter but the key part here and this is a theme that i will you know you know bring you more and more is that i am listening and of course we had our our pitch our concept like hey man just write us a check and we'll be out of here right you know but right. I could hear what was going on in the room. And I stopped the meeting. And I went to Stan and I looked him in the eye and he said, look, we've got a real business here that we can take advantage of. We built a little fledgling business at CBS that's growing at 50% a month, by the way. Right. And this is a real opportunity. I didn't argue with him. I didn't, you know, and the one key important lesson is that when you're trying to raise money, you know, I've only seen investors invest in really in two types of people. You either got this crazy kid founder that's literally crazy. They are so like off the wall, off the charts, crazy, right? But so passionate. That you're thinking to myself, hmm, maybe this guy's got something. He did get into Stanford, but right. now he wants to leave, right? I mean, 
you've got that. But that's the we were sure, sure. situation. That, yeah. Right. <laughs> and then what you've got is you've got the other approach, which is a kind of a methodical, like I look at this person and I feel like I can trust that person. Right. And that's really the, that's it. Did you get the one guy, the crazy person, or you've got this other super like committed individual that you feel whatever happens, they're going to protect my money as best they can. And right. It is through that kind of, you know, the the surety that you have, the oneness. When you achieve things in martial arts, it forces you to do difficult things. Like, you know, I, yeah. when I had to get my black belt test in Taekwondo, you know, I had to put my hand through a brick. I had to break, you know, four boards with my elbow back kicks that were, you know, through multiple boards that were perfectly, exactly, you know, precise. I mean, of course, everybody was not moving, but, you know, right. it was not easy. I had to do a three-on-one where I was fighting three guys at once, right? And, of course, you're never going to win that. But, again, it was their version of this is your big, you know, you're going to have to step up and prove to me that you learned your stuff and, it's, and it's, it takes, you know, huge effort, hard work. Right. And going to college, is, in theory, is like a proof point of that, right? So when you have that as part of you, it's something that's part of your core. So that when you communicate to someone else, you can be clear in your commitment. And so, you know, so I'll, I'll roll forward. We raised our money right. and we're starting to, to do well. We're now in San Francisco got a really cool furniture store loft space that was double high ceilings. And it's just, you know, we're doing everything, right? We're yeah, building our own you're, furniture you're where, you know, we're like yeah. the four cool kids. And, you know, one of our, you know, first customers that we get is a company called Sony. And <laughs> who are they? Yeah, and <laughs> this is like 1996 now. Sony right. is going to, if you can believe it, sell computers. They're actually going to sell computers. So they're going to launch and sell computers. Where our firm is in there competing with all the heavy hitters, the big Madison Avenue, you know, agencies that know how to advertise and do all this cool stuff that make television commercials, do all that stuff. We're in there basically saying we're going to basically do your online presence. There's a guy, Tak, who I met in one meeting at the very beginning and one towards the end. Japanese guy, old, you know, kind of sitting in the meeting, giant table, right? You're in there and there's sort of like, you know, 12, 15 people sitting there from their team. And there's just the four of us. And, you know, we got, of course, invited to the dance because of some other things. Like we're the... You know, we're the token online little company, kind of like the requirement that they have to get to basically be able to go with the big company. Right. And we're in the meeting. And I'm watching what's happening. I'm seeing, I'm hearing, I'm feeling the energy in the room. Talk is sitting at the end of the table and I can clearly tell this is not going well for us. Like, <laughs> it's not. Like I, this is like we're just yeah. gonna we're just gonna do the runner the rigmarole roll. Here's our PowerPoint slides and do our thing. That wasn't gonna work. I could I could right. see it. I could feel it. So halfway through the meeting, I stood up and I stopped the meeting. I went to my backpack, my briefcase, and I came and I opened it and I started laying out these pieces of paper, printouts of a flow chart of all of their other websites that they had created on the table. And I said, here's what your current marketing campaign online looks like. Here's how it's organized. And I said, I think you guys can do better by doing these things. It was at that moment, 
Hawk basically turned his eyes off and looked. He saw of how much care and work that we had done in preparation. And we got that job. It is the notion of having the awareness. You know, this is just like an engagement, you know, with, a, with an opponent on the mat. Mm-hmm. And seeing what is really happening. And then having the, the wherewithal to stand up and to change your angle, to change your direction. And to say, look, this approach is not working. It's not. I need to change it now. But the ability to be willing to do that is potentially could be hard, but it's not any harder than as I just mentioned it. Well, and that touches on, uh, and, and this is very, it's ever present in martial arts, is the idea of risk. What you did was yes. risky. That could, I mean, let's say, let's say the meeting was going better than you thought it was, and you just didn't know that, and you had low EQ, and maybe you read the situation wrong, and talk loved it, and it was at that moment that they decided they actually right. didn't like your product and thought you guys were overzealous, too confident, and now they were going to go with someone else. That's a dice roll, but it's a dice roll that you made with the best research that you could have done on the moment in the environment. And you, you put your money where your mouth was and you went for it. And that's very much like rep- recognizing what's in front of you is one thing, but then acting upon it and the risk that you put yourself in of acting upon it is a very different type of mentality. And that's ever, you know, super true in, in jujitsu and training one in competition even more because then the stakes are even higher. But when you're training with your opponent and you see, Ah, the, you know, their sleeves right there, the Kamor is right there, but I'm in this very safe, stalled position. To go for that is a big risk. I could lose position. I could end up in a worse position. Do you feel like that moment, of course, in the moment, you're not thinking about martial arts, right? You're not going, you know, I've in Taekwondo, right. <laughs> I'm going to go for this. Uh, but do, I feel like, that is a personality trait or a characteristic that is it's it's further refined through the practice of martial arts and maybe it's present in the individual prior but do you ever look back on those types of situations and feel like they were really part of your martial arts character was representing itself within the world of business uh, i mean it, it's an interesting point right is it is it um dna versus you know refinement uh, of that. I, I mean, you know, Don Herr, you know, makes an interesting comment. He basically says, you know, jujitsu does not make people better people. Right? <laughs> it essentially gives yeah. power to an individual and it amplifies yeah. who they are. Yeah, totally. You know, and so in, totally. in, in, in that kind of thinking, right, you know, I, I would argue that, yes, I've probably always been an entrepreneur. And I've probably all been the guy that knocked on your door and wanted you to buy the candy bar, right? But, um, and thinking of different ways to convince you to buy the candy bar. Um, right. <laughs> but I do think that what martial arts does bring you is significant, you know, um, advancement in basically giving you the confidence and the awareness to, you know, I look at it as leadership uh, to, to really take action. You know, I think whether you're right or wrong becomes, you know, I mean, it's great when you execute and you get that, you know, Kimura, but I think at the same time, it's just the fact that you can do the, that you can try to do the execution. Right. And I think that's kind of what life is in some ways that, you know, I, I look at it as from the, you know, I, I, I look at it as the interactions in business follow a very similar kind of path. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I, I don't think there are, 
I don't think that's as confusing or mysterious as a lot of people would like to think about it as. I think all interactions are relatively the same. I, I, I know that's kind of dumb, dumbifying, you know, things a little bit, but I've kind of come to that belief. Like, you, like if you roll forward all the way to now, in my business mm -hmm. career, I, 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 it's hard to explain. It's like, I don't feel, I feel like if you drop me into any situation, never done it before, whatever, right? That business, I would be fine. Yeah. It's like speaking, a, it's like being fluent and getting dropped in a country. You, you speak and understand business on a fluid level on an intrinsic yeah. level and and it's just about it, it's about kind of the basic blocking and tackling the the people dynamics understanding mm -hmm. you know but i think i relate a, a huge chunk of that to just the fact that i i've spent a long time trying to be centered mm -hmm. and i think when we're in base you know, to use another term, you know, Hinkson's kind of, yeah. you know, it gives you, when you operate from a position of stability and you're not on your tippy toes trying to grab at the thing, um, that works most of the time. You know, so I, I, I think about it like that, you know, that you know, the, the core principles of working with other people, whether they're in business or whether they're on the mat, I fundamentally believe are the same. When, <clears throat> if you look back on your, well, your, we'll say your life up to this point. One thing that I've, I've admired about you and it's it's something that I, I hope to emulate my the rest of my life is that despite your successes and the way that things have gone from an entrepreneurial from a business standpoint you've maintained this journey that is very intensive within the realm of martial arts it is demanding not only on your body but also on your life it's a time commitment to to advance in anything there's an opportunity cost. And when you're putting forth your time on the mats, whether it's in Hapkido, Taekwondo, Jiu Jitsu, that's time that could be spent doing other things. It could be spent on, you know, flying to monitor some portion of your business. It could be relationship building. It could be family time. So there's this sacrifice that you've made over and over and over again. And at this point, anyone listening, there, there's quite a few payoffs, <laughs> I would say, for that time investment. But how did you find a way to manage the demands of the two and, and, and not stray from that because so many people get chewed up and spit out by one or the other. Either business drives them into the ground, ruins their relationship, destroys their family, destroys friendships, and they get the, the monetary and the career benefits on the end of it. Or it's the other. They advance along some other journey that they're on and as a result their relationships and their business suffer. So to manage both at a high level and, and continue to manage them through so many stages of life, what's the secret sauce there? Um, I, I think you have to decide what is important to you. You have to, you know, it's a cliche term, you have to focus. Um, you know, for me, you know, for the last, you know, about, you know, a little bit over 10 years, I've been really focused on a lot more of my health because at 57 now, it's becoming tougher, right? You know, as you mentioned, it's possible to have injuries, which I have a number of them. And, and so, you know, everything becomes harder as you get older. Your maximum heart rate, you know, declines one, one beat essentially every, every year, right? Um, and, and in injuries take longer, you know, to recover and maybe even learning is not as fast as it used to be. Right. Um, yeah. 
So you have to make choices. But the choices that I've made, I've decided that health and wellness is a very important part of what I need in my life. Right? And, you know, what I would tell people is that if you can commit just five minutes a day, right? If I told you you could commit five minutes a day, every day, and then you can have every, anything in the world you want, would you do that? Certainly. I certainly would. <laughs> you know, so that's essentially what I did. I said to myself, okay, what, what's going to be good for me? And I did a lot of research. And so I started on this path, you know, not unlike so many other people of doing these breathing meditation things. I, you know, Wim Hof is somebody that I, that I really, you know, follow. So I started reading books about breathing, understanding that really. And, and I had had, you know, other instructors from before also focused on breathing, even from the Taekwondo days long ago, and even to, you know, Hapkido days, and even to now. But it was like, got more and more clarified. So I said, okay, breathing's important. Meditation is important, right? Oh, this cold therapy thing, right? I, I, I take my wife for a knee injury to one of those cryo places. I walk out of there. It's like $60. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, and so I said to myself, I got a pool. I can just do a cold plunge every day. And I can do a cold shower and, you know, when I'm traveling. That's not a problem. And so... You, they build on themselves. You basically say, what is important? You carve out that interval of time. So it, it gets to some extreme point, right? Like, you know, I guess I want to train in jujitsu, but I might have business meetings on the phone and stuff. So sometimes, I don't know, you, you know, I'll be parked at the gym. <laughs> Literally, I'll be parked there. You know, if the, if the gym, if the thing's starting at 8.30 for morning class, I might be there at 6 a.m. on the phone having a business meeting and having my second one at 7 just so that I can literally walk into the gym, train, and walk back out and be working again. Yeah. I mean, you do what you need to do to make the things that are important to you happen. So it's a cliche, right? You know, just list the things that are important focus on those things, do those things. But what I found is that if you can instill the muscle of not thinking of it as this overwhelming thing, but rather it's just a small increment, right? I'll just start with five minutes of meditation or five minutes of breathing or three minutes in a cold shower, right? right? If you build that discipline to just add that to your life, right? Those 20, 30 minutes didn't cost anything. You add that to your life, the return and payback is going to be tremendous. It's hard It's hard for people to see that. that. I mean, again, cut from a very similar cloth. That's exactly how I unpack anything for myself or for clients I've worked with in the past is let's let's refine this down to the most manageable, smallest hurdle to jump over. It's if it's, you know, don't think of it as I'm going to go to the gym every day for, for six months so I can get the results. Let's just start by packing our gym bag and put the gym bag by the door at night. Let's start there. And some days you'll grab it and some days you won't. And then we'll refine this process again. Or if it's, oh, I can, you know, I can't get to training because it's at 830 and I got business meetings. Ben does. Ben just gets up at 5 a.m. and he drives to the gym, right? Like there is a solution. There always is a solution. And people get hung up on the grandioseness of what they're actually trying to do, that they would love to get involved in jujitsu. They'd love to start going to CrossFit. But it's that initial step is so great. It's so far away that they haven't refined it down to something manageable. It's, just, it's the same problem. People struggle with sleeping better. Mm -hmm. I can't get into bed earlier. I won't fall asleep. Of course you won't because you're trained to not fall asleep. But if you focus on putting your phone away five minutes earlier each night and then that starts to affect the stimulation and then that five can become 10 
and now your phone's away 30 minutes before and you're actually starting to wind down and now you're in bed earlier and then you replace that with right. reading and now you're reading 40 minutes and now you're asleep. It's like the steps are very small and it's actually one of the amazing things about martial arts is this you're forced if you stick around and keep doing this, you are forced to learn patience. You, you can't have the black belt the first day you start. You have to make mistakes and you have to keep coming when you don't want to and find a way to work through and around injury and learn respect with your training partners. And it, it teaches you how long this journey is. And if you're not enjoying it on the day to day or, or becoming attached to the process part of it, it won't last. But you find the ways like you have to. I love that about your meeting. It's, so, it's totally something that I, w I would do and, ha and have done, actually. Uh, but really finding a way to make it work because it matters to you. This is important to your life and your longevity and your well-being. But it's hard for some people. I, I think, you know, I think that the magic to this is, is the continuity it is mm -hmm. the consistency aspect of a thing. And so I would say, you know, you divide it into the small pieces, but the real thing that I ask of you is that you must do this thing that I ask of you every day. Every day, you will give me five minutes. You will give yourself five minutes. Right. Doesn't matter if, you know, what it was. It's just that you do that every day. It's just like in the military when you make your bed, right? Right. It, it, it's a hallmark. It's a flag that you put in the ground. Okay. I did this for myself this morning. And, it, and, and you can just start with that smallest of increment, but that it's daily. It's that compound effect. It's meditation was a lot like that for me. I rejected it for so long. It was a recommendation from my mom forever and ever, and I, n I never wanted anything to do with it. And it wasn't until later you know, in my 20s that I started to try. And it started like that. I mean, it's two minutes. It was hard for me to sit for two minutes. It was honestly hard to walk away and sit for two minutes, not fidget, not think about wanting to be somewhere else, and that practice has grown into something much, much greater over that time. But it had to start with that. It had to start with, you know, rain or shine, I'm going to do this every day. And it was a borderline excruciating. I mean, two minutes? That's, that's such an insignificant amount of time. Yet it, it was harder for me to do that than to work a 10-hour day. You know, that's insane. It's a, it's a mental mind, mind switch, right? If yeah. you can do a simple thing and you can do it consistently every single day then at least for me i've now conquered you know the rest of the things i mean it's just another piece like like when i do the cold things right and i, I either i'm in the plunge or the pool i get out when i you know before i even come to the gym i've already done you know a cold swim and then when I get back, I do a cold plunge. But the fact that I already did that for the three minutes, like it was win. uncomfortable, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I mentally just did it. So by the time I get to the mat and someone's crushing me, <laughs> right? You know, it's like it's uncomfortable. But I can guarantee you it's not, you know, the only thing that was uncomfortable for me when I started my day. And, and so right. it just, it's just an even keel. How do you approach the cold therapy? Do you do it precisely to a Wim Hof method, like exactly how he structures it? Or have you adopted your own version? I've adapted, you know, so a couple things like for Wim Hof, I basically do this extreme Tibetan style breathing thing, right? That it really kind of came mm -hmm. derived from in the morning. Like holotropic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do these. Kind of like, yeah. The, you know, 30 deep breaths, I exhale out, yeah. I hold, right? And then I do a deep, you know, 
inhale, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I basically do this back and forth for three sessions. By the time I'm at the third session, you know, I'm literally getting a DMT high in my head. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and because the, the body thinks it's about to perish. So it's going to emit these hormones right. and these chemicals. And I basically have changed the time. So like, you know, the first time I, I have a smaller breath hold, the second time is a little bit longer. By the third time, it's long enough or it's uncomfortable enough. It's actually emitting something. And that's right before you enter the pool. Correct. So what happens is I do that. I then basically kind of get into a moment of silence for a little period after that. Mm-hmm. I wait for the DMT to finish its, its process. Then from there, I will basically go to the cold pool. Now, what was interesting is in, in, in you know, one of the books that was, you know, looking at, at Wim Hof, I forget the New York Times writer that was trying to basically, you know, initially say, you know, he wasn't real, right? And there's right. a scene in the book where Wim Hof is taking the, the writer guy and they're basically in some like Swedish or Norwegian, you know, ice lake thing, plunging yeah. in. And he's commenting to the guy. He said, oh, this is really great. You'll be able to like do a double dip here kind of thing, right? Or a double thing, right? And he's like, what is that? You know, and that's basically getting into the ice cold lake, getting out and then going back in again. (laughs) You know, so I basically I started with cold showers. Then what happened was I said, okay, I've got this pool. I'm just going to do that. And then I get out. So you just leave it unheated and then it gets to like what? 40 something. It's it's, it's like around 48 right now. It's It's cold. cold. Let's be it's cold. With the the ambient wind, you know, it's pretty cold. So you, you get in. You get out, and then I take a cold shower after. Does the cold shower feel almost warm in comparison? The first one doesn't, but after my cold <laughs> plunge, which is my plunge is usually set between thirty six to forty, it does. That's so interesting. I'm like I'm very in the past couple of months I've been. <clears throat> We've been going doing sauna once a week over at this place called Rejuve in Encinitas. It's like you pay each time you go, which is horrendous. It's kind of like the sixty dollar cryotherapy thing every time, and you're like, "What a what am I doing here?" So I've been uh, yeah, electricians coming over today because I'm going to try to put a sauna in the back and then also do the cold plunge this summer. And in sauna, there's this the last five minutes every single time I do it is just as bad as the last time I did it. Like there's no evolution in my brain's ability to like psych up for it. I, I hit this point and, and I'm very much like, it, we'll have to exchange some books after this because I, I've become over the past two years obsessed with breathing, with nasal breathing, with just breathe, breath approach, oxygen advantage, just like everything about it. It is, it's totally changed my life. And as someone who's my whole life suffered from congestion it's improved it a lot it hasn't fixed it but it's improved it a lot doing these practices and i can control my breathing a hundred percent nasally uh over a 30 minute sauna for all 20 to 25 wow. minutes it gets you know it gets excruciatingly more difficult but it, it's possible i can lay flat and just in the nose out the nose in the nose out the nose the last five minutes there is nothing I can think about other than how excruciating and how bad I want out with the door right there, right? You're just face looking at the door, thinking about how bad you want to be on the other side. And it's the strangest mental like warfare that goes on in my head. And it, it unregulates all my, all this control that we're talking about, right? I, I lose all the control factors, start breathing out of my mouth. I can't, I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit and I'll just meditate. And then I, I can't sit still. And so I switch, I'll stretch. And then stretching doesn't feel good. And it's like, I go for that last five minutes. I go for that little bit of time that I can't figure out how, why I can't control it. And it's, it's that like mental adaptation that I, I notice so much in training. That transfer of like, sometimes you got to just, you got to just sit in it and and be and suffer through whatever the thing is it's so strange and i can only imagine that the cold plunge has some sort 
sort of factor like that that I can barely do a cold shower. I mean, I struggle, struggle to do a cold shower. You know, the way I would say it is um, it's never been comfortable for me to do it. <laughs> you know, um, it, but I can say this after I've done it, I'm like rebirthed. Like, you know, like I wake up in the morning, yeah. my routine basically is I have one of those inverter stretcher machines. So I stretch yep. on that thing, right? Because I'm like sore. I have, you know, my whole body yeah. has all these different things that are sore, right? So I, I basically stretch. I basically do breathing, which is essentially another big chunk of muscles you're really exercising, right? 1,000%. And then I basically do the cold swim, right? And I, I get cold. But when I come out of there, it's like I'm just like out of a chrysalis. I'm just like... I'm good. Like, you know, all these little tiny, little <laughs> tiny, whatever. Right. Yeah. I'm good. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm at a level where I feel, okay, you know, bring it on. And I think it's just, it's just training yourself. I think to just be comfortable, like we say in jujitsu with the uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you do it, the the easier it is, the the more you know comfortable it becomes. I mean, I'm not saying it's comfortable, but I'm also saying that I mentally know because I don't just jump in the pool. I walk in, I wade in, you know, and then I basically it sounds so put horrible. my arms in after I wade, and then I do a full dunk, and then I pop up and I swim, right? You know, and by doing that, by just embracing what is in front of me it all works man you're you're motivating me so much to start doing cold showers i mean it's changed my life i would i just tell you it's changed a, a whole big portion yeah. of of my life cuz i'm very much i'm a very much a fan of these small wins the, the making your bed example is one that it stuck with me for, I've just always done that. I've always made my bed. I don't know. Maybe my mom was uh, wanted me to or something, but then I always just did it. And it's a, it's a joke between my fiance and I, because she's not a bed maker and I am. And there's something about that. The, like the very first thing that you do or that, that first hour for me is like a very sacred time first hour when I wake up at five from five to six is like a very, very special time for me between the meditation practice, breathing practice, breath holds, and then just general clarity around like how I want to put myself forward into the day, knowing well and good that control is <laughs> out of my hands, but to at least begin to start there. And like the, <laughs> the cold thing just, as much as I want that that win to start like that and to, to have that feeling, because I've had it before when I try to do this, when I try to implement this into like a thing. Uh, and maybe actually as I'm talking about this out loud, I'm really just approaching it wrong as I'm going for the max duration out the gate. Like maybe I start with a little bit less. But I, I want to add something like that that is uh, currently everything I'm doing I want to do. I want to meditate for clarity and and perception of consciousness and i want to stretch in the morning because it feels good this is something that i'm avoiding because i don't want to do it what if i told you it would so I, you maybe that alone maybe 20 percent better i mean you've already like without trying to sell me you've already sold me i'm i want to drink the kool-aid what okay so what do you start with on that like what's a good way to get into I, it Right. I don't have a pool, yeah. so I'm not going to do the Look, whole I, I waiting. I think the most important thing is consistency. You do what agreed. can be done and replicated. Cold shower is is usually available. You know, if if you're, if not, then you're standing outside with a hose, right? But uh, you know, the reality right. is is that you know you do what can be done consistently. That's the key. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like you're going to uh, you're going to ask me next time I see you if I've I... <laughs> if I've started doing this. Actually, you know what? I, I want you to because it's <laughs> going to put a little bit of pressure on me to instill this. Because I, I I agree with you. I think that 
it is about consistency and to everything that we just talked about it's about starting with like the the mvp right you want to get it down to what is that low frequency that you can do to try anything new and and hopefully someone listening can think about it maybe it's not the cold plunge maybe it's not a cold shower maybe it's jujitsu okay. uh, right maybe I'll you give can you get another incentive. Half what if i class. told you to reverse your agent well i mean i'm very much a fan of pretty much anything on that <laughs> front so yeah you know look i i would just tell you you know for myself the 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 breathing the meditation the cold therapy has really changed my life um and in in very measurable ways you know and so i'll give you an analogy um you know i had a doctor's report last year and they did blood work and you know i'm 57 right my testosterone level is at 1200 and for a person my age it's not supposed to be there naturally like that um and so the doctor said it's impossible (laughs) so as he's staring at we're gonna have to conduct three more tests yeah one of them is basically i'm carrying around a jug for 24 hours you know um and all the tests came back the same my sister, who's also a wow. doctor, I called her. I said, you know, what do you think? Because she also does, you know, a lot of her, she also has a wellness practice. And part of that practice is testosterone replacement therapy. Yeah. And she said to me, she said, look, Ben, you're constantly putting your body under the stress. As long yeah. as you continue to do that, your body's going to continue to emit hormones to defend itself. Right. So essentially, with that, right? Um, it's helping me live a more right. fulfilling life in real terms. Things that can right. be measured. In, in statistical, yeah, exactly. Right? And that's a big part. That's a big part. So I know it works. And what I'm saying yeah. to you is, is it will change your life. And it's free. <sighs> There's not, nothing to buy, no seminars to attend. It's free. Right. Well, I'm going to... Um start tomorrow <laughs> I, I i really feel, well by the time people listen to this it'll be a week from today so i will have been doing it for several days uh i'm, I'm very motivated to do it especially more now I, I was hesitant before i knew that this was part of your kind of daily and so i'm excited that we touched on it uh one one last thing that i would like to maybe close with here yeah. is uh and i and i ask you this because You've been able to experience this across three different martial arts disciplines, and it's present in each one. And it's this idea of patience. And I'm curious what your perception is of patience and how it's played into your journey within the martial arts, and if that's spilled at all into your personal life. So let's look at the word patience, right? I think of it of, of the concept of patience as being the notion that you had some expectation that wasn't being met in a certain frame, right? So if you removed the expectation, then there is no concept of patience. You're just engaging with what is now. And so I yeah. I, I, I I liken it to that, right? And I would I would tell you that it's it's about being comfortable in the present with what I have now in front of me. And if I can be comfortable, I don't need any additional muscle, patient muscles to, to, you know, be formed. It's just what is here. So what I would say to you is it's about the, the, the consistent journey, the consistent journey, whether it's a martial art, whether it's a business you love, whether it's someone you want to be with, it's that part that's the most important. It's the this. Yeah. The immediacy. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Man, it's... <laughs> I, 
I don't want to say frustrating as it is more like it's, and it's not surprise. I don't, I don't really know the word I'm looking for here, but uh, there's so many adages that just seem the more people I talk to that have been on this planet much longer than I have, the more that you just see that there's these similarities and truths that exist, this being one of them. And it's true uh, in people on an individual level. It's true if you look to secular and non-secular visions of the world. Is this goal of presidents, the here and now, the now being the most important thing? And I go back to that that conflict of like being able to recognize something but not being able to appreciate it at the same time. Like I can hear you say that and I, I truly see what it is that you're saying, but it's hard to accept it and, and like instill that into my life, if that makes sense. I, I, I and my, 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 my only thing I would say to you is, is um, just do the five minutes. <laughs> Well, then, that I mean, that's the mic drop moment and the truth right there. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, Ben. It is, it's been honestly a pleasure having you on. It's so exciting seeing where these conversations go because I always come into it with some intention and research and ideas that I have, but uh, they always surprise me, and we end up in places that I didn't anticipate. So I really appreciate you being open and, and taking the time to do this. Uh, likewise, I'm honored, and uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it. It's been fun. Excellent. Well, you have a great day, Ben. I'll I'll chat with you later.